right, well, good morning. Uh, so my name is Chris Zarbaugh, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I, and I have the privilege of unpacking uh, the most difficult question that exists in humanity. So uh, I've only preached on this topic or tackled or discussed this topic maybe just a handful of times in my entire career as a pastor for 30 years. Uh, the, I just want to go ahead and speak into the song by the fray that we just heard tracing, uh, who did a great job, but it's actually, uh, not only did the writer of the fray have a dream that God looked like Bruce Springsteen, but uh, actually in this dream, he confronted him on the corner with all of his frustrations because he had just lost a loved one and his friend's uh, wife just had a miscarriage, and in this dream, he had confronted God on the street corner and just basically, you know, laid into him saying, God, why? And really, that is the heart behind why that song was written and why we chose it. And so we're diving into this topic together. I would love to pray uh, as we begin. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We ask your blessing on our time together, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us from your word and help us to see your truths and your heart. And I pray, Lord, that we would, uh, in all of our skepticism, with all of our issues and with all of our questions and our anger and our bitterness that comes from topics like this, I pray, Father, that we would be willing, just willing, to give you permission to hear from you this morning. For we love you, we thank you, we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so I'm gonna start off with, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a phrase, and if you know this phrase, I want you to shout out the rest of it, and maybe at home too, online, you can do the same, okay? So, God is great, God is good. Okay, all right, so half of you got it, half of you didn't. All right, so in, in case you didn't know, maybe it's not as popular as I think. The answer, the correct answer was, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for this food. From his hands we must be fed, give us, O Lord, our daily bread, amen. Now, that's a, that's a prayer in a can, right? And I grew up with that prayer and that prayer only, and we said grace every single time. We grew up as, uh, as uh, Catholics, uh, kind of non-practicing Catholics. I'm the youngest of five brothers, okay? So I'm the youngest of five brothers. And every single time when we sat down, my mom would say, say grace, and that was the phrase. And by the way, that always bothered me. You know what, you know what bothered me about that prayer is that God is God is great, God is good, and we thank him for the food. I always wonder why good and food didn't rhyme because they're spelled the same. Because the English language is complicated, right? Isn't that weird? I mean, don't even get me started about comb, tomb, and bomb. I mean, come on. So anyway, the point is, is that I'm the youngest of five brothers, and my mom looked at Chucky in this one particular day. She, you know, she had just about had it. You could tell she was completely stressed. We had sat down, and this is the story I remember. She looked at my oldest brother, Chucky, and she said, Chucky, say grace. And so we all did this. We all bowed our heads, and Chucky said, grace. And then we looked up, and my mom's like, ah. She's like, Donnie, which is the next in line. Donnie, say grace. And he goes, okay. And so we all did this again. And then Donnie goes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so finally she gets really upset. And she's like, stop it. She's like, I said, say grace. And she looked at Tommy and she goes, Tommy, say grace. And then we all like, you know, kind of bowed her head. And we were like all waiting in a moment of silence. And Tommy said, four score and seven years ago. And all of a sudden my mom, you know, she looks over and, you know, she's only got two left. So she looks at Jimmy and she's like, Jimmy, say grace. And so Jimmy actually started to say the Pledge of Allegiance of the flag. And so finally, she was so upset. And I remember her looking at me and she knew that I was the last option. And she goes, Chrissy, that's what she called me, right? Well, she had no other choice. Chucky, Donnie, Tommy, Jimmy. Of course I'm Chrissy. So she goes, Chrissy. She said, say grace. And I remember like feeling the pressure because I felt the wrath of my mom, but I looked at all four of my brothers who were older than me, who looked at me like, you better not actually say grace. And so I had a choice to make, and I bowed my head, and I said, rub it up, dub three men in the tub. And, I, and she was so upset. But I remember, uh, you know, that particular instance, but uh, what I remember more so is I remember actually saying grace, uh, you know, every single time we sat down to eat, uh, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for this food. And by the way, the beginning of that prayer indicates and makes a lot of statements, right? So in other words, God is great means that he is all powerful. And God is good means he is all loving, doesn't it? And so, but because we live in a world, uh, you know, faced with imperfection, with evil and suffering that we witness every day in this imperfect world, um, you know, we, we, if not careful, we could conclude that either God is all powerful, but he's not all loving, right? Or we must say that, you know, maybe God is all loving, but maybe perhaps he is not all powerful after all. 
Or heck, maybe he, is, maybe he isn't either of those things. So here is a viewpoint that's totally legitimate. Imagine if I were standing, and picture this, if I were standing by a lake and I was watching hundreds of people drowning and I had a speedboat right next to me and I stood at the shoreline and I did nothing at all to save them. Here's the question. What would you think of me about the kind of person that I was? And more importantly, would you want to have a relationship with me? Would you want to hang out with me? Would you want to learn anything from me? And that's a legitimate viewpoint, isn't it? And so when it comes down to it, um, if we can't figure out what is going on in the Bible about God's nature and evil and suffering in the world, there will always be a barrier between us and God. Because there is something inside of you and there is something inside of me that wants to understand why. And isn't that the question, why? And, and sometimes we'll never know why this side of eternity, but that does not mean that we don't try, do we? We, we try hard. Like, we, like, like listen, I, it, I lost, I lost somebody early. They, they died. I'm just giving you an example. But as long as I know the purpose of why they passed away, then I'll be okay. Because if there's a greater good, it won't take the pain away, but at least it'll give me some sort of you know, closure or some sort of understanding because I can't understand why bad things happen. I have to figure out why uh, my wife left me, why uh, I lost my retirement in a big crash, why in the world you know, did I lose my job? If I just understand why this tragedy happened, then I'll have a little bit of closure and it'll make the pain a little more bearable. And by the way, I would say that's natural, isn't it? That is totally natural for us to do because you and I know what it's like to elect for pain for the greater good down the road. I mean, every time you exercise, you elect for pain for the greater good down the road. If you've ever sat through getting a tattoo, you have elected for pain for you know, the desired result at the end. And, and, and it's natural for us to look for that. Now, I got to tell you that my wife worked as an NA at Beaumont Hospital here in Troy, or over in Troy, uh, and she did that for nearly 15 years, and almost 10 of those years was spent on the oncology floor. So, you know, where people primarily have cancer, and so she was in the very much the habit of seeing people come in, get treatments, and then losing those people. And she would lose patients that she knew almost on a daily basis. And then, side note, she would have to prepare the body and also talk and deal with the family. Now, because my wife is a pastor's wife, uh, they loved having her there. It was very hard on her after 10 years. And so she said, can I have a transfer? And she switched to mother baby, which was so much happier. She went from, like, literally death to life. Life. And so for 10 years, they loved having my wife on that floor because even though as a hospital, you're not supposed to bring up faith, you have to imagine that when people are at the end of their life, faith is a pretty big topic, isn't it? Right? And so people would ask for chaplains and they would ask about religion. They would ask about faith and ask about God. And almost everybody in the floor knew where to go. You know, send Liz Zarba, whoop, you know, calling Liz Zarba. And they would send Liz into this, you know, room or the waiting room or the actual room where Liz would actually engage in conversations with people about, you know, about all sorts of things. And here's what my wife would tell me often, very often, here's what would happen. Some person would just pass and then, uh, you know, something would transpire. And let's just say like a nurse through that family's experience somehow got on a conversation with God and that nurse decided to become a Christian. She decided to trust, you know, and put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then my, and then my wife would say that the family would say, well, that's the reason why my husband died. It, she, he died so that nurse could be saved. You know, and that's, that's what they would say. And, 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 and by the way, that's natural. But I got news for you, that's not why he died. But it's natural for people to, to try to connect the dots and try to make those conclusions. So this question, like all tough questions, is a tough question because it precisely does not have an easy answer. I want you to know that this question has been talked about and debated and, you know, tried to be, you know, tried... Uh, to, uh, sought for resolution or an explanation, probably more than any other question in our hum humanity, in our history. And, and I want you to know that just like a lot of tough questions, there are basically two uh, theories or two camps of beliefs that people have fallen under. And so I want to read for you two excerpts from two famous apologetics experts that primarily explain both of these views. And I'll tell you which one that we're going to be talking about today. Here's the first view. 
One perspective is that God is good and he is sovereign and he is all powerful and thus in control of all things. So we have to choose to trust his sovereign goodness and that nothing happens in the end that is not outside his will. Everything happens within the context of God's will. His purposes and the purpose of evil and suffering may not be clear or make sense to us. And this, we have to trust God whose ways are just simply higher than our ways. Often the growth and suffering that brings about is emphasized in this view. A book that we recommend explains this viewpoint uh, is written by John Piper and it is called Suffering and the Sovereignty of God. Now before I read the next view, I just want to go on record and say I never understood this first view. Because being a young Christian, I grew up in a very conservative denomination and I would often hear people in my church refer to this view. And I never understood it because for me, and I'm just telling you, me personally, that it, it never seemed to align with what I knew about God. It never seemed to align with the characteristics and the nature of God. And so like, for instance, I would hear of tragedies uh, happening like a four-year-old gets cancer and dies. And then people, I would literally hear this phrase. They would say, well, that's God's perfect will. As hard as it is to hear, that's God's perfect will. To which I witnessed as a young Christian training to be a pastor, most people saying, well, if that's who God is, then I don't want to be a part of him at all because I don't want to be a part of God who that's his perfect will, right? Why would he do that? And so, you know, you know, wrestling with that. Well, it's his sovereign will. And that is the first view. Here's the second view. The other viewpoint is about, uh, about suffering is based on the idea that God has allowed freedom and the result of that freedom exercised in a way that is outside of God's will accounts for evil and suffering. In addition, this view emphasizes that there is another class of beings, namely Satan and his evil angels, otherwise known as demons, that account for much of the evil and suffering. A book that expresses this viewpoint is written by Dr. Greg Boyd, and it is called, Is God to Blame? I want you to know that I have aligned myself with a second view that, hu that, that basically emphasizes human freedom and uh, the activity of Satan in the world today, accounting for evil and suffering, and that is the view that I want to unpack this morning. Now, it's important to know right off the bat that the scripture tells us that God is not obligated to explain his ways to us. And, 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 and the idea that we demand uh, an explanation from God and that we should suppose upon God the why is as ridiculous as me making pottery out of a piece of clay and then the clay turning it to me and telling me, you know, how I am the way that I am or telling me why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And, and, and that's so that's what the scripture clearly says. In fact, that's actually the human clay illustration is actually one that is used all throughout the scriptures. So I'm going to read for you a string of verses. I don't expect you to write them down because I'm going to bullet point right through them. However, you can just sit back and let them wash over you. Here are five scriptures in a row that are very strong. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says this, it is God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. Isaiah 45 15, truly, O God of Israel, our savior, your work is uh, you, you work in mysterious ways. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may follow all the words of his law. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number five. As you do know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in the mother's womb, or excuse me, as you do not know those things, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And then finally, Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So, we have to get that out of the way and we have to understand that. So we do understand that God is, number one, not obligated to explain himself, but at the same time, we understand that his purposes and his ways are things that we cannot see, okay? But let me, let me, let me pack, unpack this uh, freedom uh, theory with this simple question, and here's the question for today. The question for today is this, can there be real love without freedom? So can there be real love without freedom? In other words, why, why didn't God just create us all as robots to serve him? Like, why, why didn't God create you know, humanity if, if humanity has freedom to do wrong things? Why didn't he just take that away? If God could do anything, then why didn't he just make us to love him? 
well, would that be true love? That is the question. In fact, this notion was explored way back uh, when Jim Carrey starred in a movie called Bruce Almighty. How many of you have seen Bruce Almighty? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, so most of you. But for those of you who have not seen this movie, Morgan Freeman uh, stars as God, which, by the way, he's the best God I've ever seen in a movie. But Morgan Freeman stars as God. Jim Carrey stars as a guy, and it's really theologically rich. I mean, it's really deep. He stars, he stars as a guy in a movie that is really frustrated with God. And he's angry with the same types of issues. And he says, God, you're not doing your job. He gets very angry. Then God shows up in the form of Morgan Freeman and actually says, hey, if you think you could do my job better than me, then I'm going to give you uh, all my powers and you could be God for like, uh, I, don't, I forget how long, but for a certain amount of time. So what ends up happening is the movie is funny because Jim Carrey decides to abuse his God powers for all sorts of things. He's too lazy to do the job. You know, he does it for his own advantage. And basically he neglects his relationship with his girlfriend, Jennifer Aniston. And then finally, at the end, toward the end of the movie, uh, she's at the point to where she wants to leave him. And so in a desperate effort, he decides to try to use his God powers for this. Love me. Love me. Love me. Love me. I did. More on this story as it develops. Enjoying your party? Nothing like spending quality time with great friends, huh? Grace left me. Yeah, I know. She'll take me back. She'll take me back, right? Would you take you back? How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? <laughs> Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. So it's amazing, isn't it? It gets you thinking. That whole movie is really deep. And when we, I mean, it really unpacks issues with God in a very deep way. Now, if you've ever seen the, the, the part two of that, Evan Almighty, it's the exact opposite. It's like no depth at all. And it's like, you know, animal build the ark. And it's all funny with Evan Baxton, which is like Stephen Carell. But this one originally started out very, very deep. And so the question that Jim Carrey posed and then God answers, he says, how can you make somebody love you without free will? And I love how Morgan Freeman says, welcome to my world. You figure that out, let me know. Now, here's the thing. The reason why God did not make us at robot, as robots, I think I could answer that one based on all the truths of the scripture, because God designed us for a relationship with him. And so you cannot have a relationship with someone who is commanded to obey you and respond to you against their will. The only way true love can exist is that if you enter into a relationship with someone who has the choice whether or not to forgive you, to love you, to accept you, to value you. And so God making us as robots would not be love. And by the way, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's only end game in his creating us is to have a personal relationship with us. It was true in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. And guess what? It is true now. Today, nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed are all the events in between where the relationship was perfect, then the relationship was broken, and then Jesus came to the earth to die on a cross to, to, for, for one reason, to forgive our sins, to establish that relationship, and then the invitation to trust Christ and walk with God so that we can have a relationship with him. Because true love cannot exist without freedom. So here are the three points that we're going to be unpacking here in just a moment. Here they are on the side screens. And that is number one, freedom makes evil possible. Mankind makes evil actual. And God makes evil redeemable. So let's look at the first one, if you would, which is freedom makes evil possible. In the very beginning, in the book of Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, which is Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, by the way, right from the very beginning, what we see is hard to imagine, but even in the Garden of Eden, which is referred to as paradise, God created Adam and Eve. And when God spoke these words, it's hard to imagine, but sin did not exist yet. 
There was, it was perfection. Adam and Eve, were, were death wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even on the radar. Adam and Eve were created to exist in an eternal, perfect relationship with God. And yet God gives them freedom and decides to say, hey, if you do this one thing, you can do anything except for this one thing. And if you do this one thing, you'll surely die. And if you want to go back and read the rest of the story, it says that Satan, the enemy of our soul, the evil one that existed, and there's a history behind that, but Satan comes up and basically tries to twist the truth and says, you're not going to die. Take a bite. Take a bite of the fruit. Most of us know it as an apple. It doesn't say it was an apple, by the way. It was just a fruit. So we don't know what it was, but, 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 but Satan said, you won't die. Take a bite and see. And so they took a bite. They didn't die right away, but death came on the scene and it was basically, you know, a part of the whole entire equation. Now, it's really important to understand this. Here's a bad argument that you could come up with from these events. Here's the bad argument. That God is the author of everything, therefore evil is something, therefore God is the author of evil. A very important thing to see from this is we need to detach God as the source of evil. We think it comes from God, but even today, the world we live in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it's not on the screen, but what does it say? Uh, Jesus says the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. So a true argument would be this. Here's a better argument and a true argument. That number one, God gave man freedom, and that word man refers to humanity, right? That word is an ancient word without the article, which refers not to just a male, but men, women, and children, for all humanity. God gave man freedom. Free men choose uh, good or evil, and free men do choose good or and evil. Now that theory uh, explains why somebody pulls a gun on somebody and shoots them, right? That theory, uh, we could easily see how, you know, somebody would drink and drive and, and you know, and cause an accident. We would say, yeah, that's, that's, that, that makes sense. But what about the other kinds of evil and suffering in the world? What about like, you know, children getting cancer or, you know, even elderly people getting cancer and dying? What about earthquakes and tsunamis? And what about natural disasters? God is the author of all those, Please understand this, that when God said, you will surely die, when death came on the scene, there's a couple of things we need to understand. In fact, Romans 8 is a passage that we're going to end with. We're going to read the whole thing in Romans 8. But I want you to know beforehand that Romans 8 tells us that this world exists and it tells us that we live under the bondage of sin, that it's actually the whole world groans under the death and decay of sin. In other words, when sin came on the scene, not only did our DNA change, if you want to talk about why people get sick, our entire DNA changed in that moment, didn't it? And in fact, even the earth changed. Even the whole cycle of the planets changed. It said that uh, part of the curse was weeds came up in the garden where there, no, where there were no weeds. The entire DNA changed on the earth and it went from perfect to not perfect. The entire DNA within our bodies went from perfect to not perfect. And free will and sin being born, the Bible says that actually you and I live with a sin nature and that we actually, uh, you know, have to trust God to depend on doing what's right over our instincts sometimes to do what's wrong. And so here's what I would tell you. I would tell you that I have graduated from college and have a degree in biblical studies as a Bachelor of Science. I have read hundreds of books. I have preached probably thousands of sermons. I've had just as many conversations in this area. And my theological view of why evil and suffering happens in the world is really boils down to saying crap happens. Crap happens because we live in a broken and messed up world. And that's what the scripture says. The scripture says that we live in a broken and messed up world. And by the way, when it comes down to it, you and I, uh, see evidence of this whole story in the scriptures. So let's, let's look at point number two, which is mankind makes evil actual. Look at Galatians chapter five, verse number 13. It says this, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. And by the way, that's a church term. That means they're writing to the church of Galatia in Galatians, right? Brothers and sisters, he's writing to Christians, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So mankind's choices make evil actual. So when I use my freedom to drink and drive, evil goes from a possibility to an actuality. Many say that these choices reveal that there is no God. So here's a bad argument. The bad argument is this. If God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God is all powerful, he could destroy evil. 
Evil is not destroyed, therefore there is no God. Okay? But here is a better and an actual true argument. Okay? If God is all good, he will defeat evil. If God is all powerful, he can defeat evil. Evil is not yet destroyed. God can and will one day defeat evil. And by the way, one of, these, one of these scriptures that we look to in Revelation chapter 21, before I read it, I want to tell you that this was written by a man named John. He's the disciple John who was stranded on the Isle of Patmos. And he said he got a vision from God, what heaven is like, and all sorts of things about the future. And he wrote down a few statements about heaven. And by the way, we don't know the half of what heaven is like, but we do know several things about heaven. And one of these statements right here, this next one in Revelation 21, verse number four, is one of the best statements that we have. It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Let me ask you a question. Won't you be glad when that day comes? Because listen, it's true, isn't it? You and I live in a broken and messed up world. And when we try to ask the question why, sometimes, if we're lucky, we'll get an answer from God. But you know what? Oftentimes, we don't know why, but we do know that God is able to take that which is bad and redeem it for good. And so sometimes we say, God, why? And we don't have the answers, but we do know this. We do know that we live in a messed up world, but we do know that oftentimes God takes that which is bad and redeems it. So I'm actually gonna, I don't even know if I'm gonna be out of the light, but I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna sit down for a second. All right, I'm gonna sit down because I wanna tell you a quick story. So my wife and I um, had two miscarriages. And by saying we had two miscarriages, I'm really saying that my wife had two miscarriages. So um, my daughter, who's 27 years old, was born uh, back in the day, back in 1994. And then uh, my wife got, and we have three kids, by the way, to the two miscarriages happened in between my first daughter and my first son. Um, so what ends up happening is, is she was very far along. I can't remember the amount of months, but I think it was somewhere around five months or so. And I remember that I wasn't there. I remember that I was taking my grandma to the airport. It was actually her grandma. And my wife had gone to the ultrasound appointment alone. And isn't it funny how you kick yourself um, for not being there for things that are totally out of your control. Are you with me on that? Yes. And so uh, I remember dropping off at the airport and my wife calling me on the phone. And she said to me, the baby is not alive and the baby's not breathing. So she had to go through what, uh, one of the most horrible procedures, which is called a, I think it's a DNC, I think it's called something like that, where they basically have to, you know, go inside and remove, uh, you know, the, the the, the baby, and, um, and then you have to wait like a year to get pregnant again, right? And so uh, then what happened was my wife got pregnant again, and so we were very excited. And then she comes along again, and she has another miscarriage. So we sit down and we talk together, and my wife looked at me in the eyes and said, I wish God would just take my life. She said, I wish it happened to me. And I'm telling you, I just, as a new husband, I just didn't know how to respond to that. I didn't really know what to do with that. And I just thought to myself, wow, but like, I'm, I'm in pain, but I obviously am not nearly in pain as much as my wife because that statement is super heavy. And so uh, I want you to know that uh, on Mother's Day, and I haven't done it for a few years, but on Mother's Day, we decided to name our two daughters. Uh, hang on. That are unborn. Uh, so we named uh, one Hannah and one Jessica. And so they were, they were two girls. So, uh, so I would sign Mother's Day cards and I would sign it from our kids when they were really infants like babies. And I would also give her a card uh, all throughout these past 20 something years uh, happy Mother's Day from Hannah and Jessica. Because the only reason why you could do that, some of you would say, why would you bring up that pain? Well, there's only one reason why. Because when you have belief in a God who loves you and you have belief that just things happen, then you believe that, you know, that I believe life exists at conception, that starts at conception. So therefore, I believe that one...
One day I'm going to meet him. I believe it. So, here's what happened. What happened is, our marriage became really strong. Okay, after that. So, our marriage became super, super strong. And our marriage was actually not that strong. It was just for a lot of reasons at that point. We were just not doing very well. But through these events, our marriage became super strong. I was in a conversation with somebody. And somebody had made a comment and said this. And said, well, maybe the reason why God had you have two miscarriages was that God would save your marriage or make it strong. To which I would say very confidently, that is not why God caused two miscarriages. However, I do believe this. God took something that was really bad and just like God does, he exchanged it and redeemed it and made it good. Because the Bible says that he brings beauty for ashes, right? He brings grace for fears. He replaces our mourning with gladness, right? Because God is in the business of redeeming evil. And so let me just go ahead and tell you this. Our third point is that God makes evil redeemable. First Peter chapter number two, verse number 24 reads this way. It says, he personally, Jesus, he personally carried our sins in his body to the cross so that, that word means for the purpose of, why did Jesus go to the cross, right? So that, here it is, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And by his wounds, you and I are healed. And so here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that God loved us so much that to solve the problem that we created as mankind, he decided to send his only son. And it's not on the, it's not on the screen, but the, the most famous verse in the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And therefore, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, Peter tells us and the gospels tell us and the New Testament tells us that Jesus is in the business of redeeming that which is bad for good. And you know what redeeming means, right? It's to exchange. It's like redeeming your coupons for value, right? We know what, we know what that word means in our society. Jesus has redeemed our sin and he has taken our sin from us. And he has paid for our sin. And what does he give us in exchange? He gives us eternal life. He gives us new life. He gives us the ability to trust him. And listen, the Bible never says that we won't have a troubled life. In fact, it says the opposite. It says we live in a broken and messed up world. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. I don't know why your tragedy happened to you, but I do know one thing for sure. In Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted who saves those who are crushed in spirit. In other words, every time that you shed a tear, I believe God sheds a tear for the broken and messed up world that we live in. And then finally, I would just tell you this. If you want a why in your life, then stop desperately trying to connect the little dots and trying to make sense of it and create a why. Don't connect the little dots. I would invite you to connect the big dots. The big dots meaning the very beginning and the very end and then also the dot in the meantime, in the middle. Because that's, excuse me, exactly what the Apostle Paul did when he wrote Romans chapter 8. Look at verses 18 through 25. Paul says, yet What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day. Against its will, everything on earth was subject. Get this. Everything on earth was subjected to God's curse. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, also groan to be released from pain and suffering. I mean, can you identify with that? And it says, now that we are saved 
right? In other words, we have salvation from Christ. We eagerly look forward to this freedom. If you already have something, you don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. So I would say, connect the big dots in your life. Stop trying to connect the small ones and come up with a reason. Just know that Paul you know, challenges us and models for us to connect the big dots in our life, which is the beginning and the end and in the meantime. And in the meantime, it gives us hope. In the meantime, it gives us the strength to endure. In the meantime, it gives us, you know, the dependence, the complete dependence upon God and also complete dependence upon each other. And yes, we live in a broken world, but praise God that one day he will eliminate and eradicate all pain and sorrow and tears and cancer and disease and suffering. And there will be a day when God will have victory over all of that. And so in the meantime, we can look to a God who promises us things to look to, to trust in him and his good nature, a God who does love us, who knows us, who cares about us, and that we would walk step by step knowing that he will never leave you, that he is beside you now, and that he is with you always, even through the hardest of situations in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you would help us to lean on you and trust in you. And God, I have to believe that there are people listening online or in this room that have wrestled with things that have kept them from praying or even attending church, Lord, possibly even for decades. And Father, we also understand and know that in the scripture, there are examples of people yelling at you, people who express their anger to you. God, you are not afraid of that. So I pray, Father, that we would bring all of our anguish to your feet. I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand that you are a God who loves us and that gives us complete freedom. And because of that freedom, we find ourselves dealing with and living in a broken world, all the more depending on you, leaning on you. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to continually find strength in you through these difficult things that we wrestle with in our lives. We love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only see Even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. Even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing.
Wow. What a great song. I don't know what you came to church dealing with today. Maybe you're watching at home right now and you showed up today. You turned on the TV, you turned on your computer and you felt broken on the inside, broken emotionally. I want you to understand that Psalm 147.3 says God will heal the brokenhearted and he will bind up their wounds. So hopefully today you heard something to give you encouragement and inspire you during this week. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for who you are. Father, we know in our minds that you are all knowing even when we don't understand. God, there's someone here in a situation. There's someone watching online right now, God, and they're in the midst of the storm and they can't see their way out. But Father, even during those times, help us to keep our trust and our hope in you. Father, give us encouragement through the storm and remind us that you are right by our side, even when it doesn't make sense. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.